Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session. I hope everyone has had a very good evening, and I hope we've all got clear heads. I have to confess the chairman has had clearer heads on other occasions, but nevertheless, I'm going to be very brave and struggle through. So I'd like to first of all acknowledge that this session has been sponsored by the Hospital of St John and St Elizabeth, and we're very grateful for their support of this session. I have to say I am plagued by the fire drill, but you know, bear with me folks, the fire drill. If you hear an announcement over the PA system, please proceed to the nearest emergency exit. Do not stop to collect your personal belongings or use the lifts. Uh, the conventional staff will assist and direct you to the muster point and then you'll be well looked after. I'm also going to ask you to switch on your mobile, off your mobile phones, but obviously if there is a fire evacuation, you need to switch them back on again so we can regroup everyone. Uh, we are going to have four speakers this morning, and then there will be some opportunity for questions. However, this is a very tight session, and we are probably going to overflow into the Knowledge Hub after this. So you're welcome to come and traipse down after us and uh, ask all the gurus here the questions that you didn't get asking them earlier on. Uh, can I also just remind you that we are uh, getting a lot of activity on hashtag UK Stroke Forum 16, so please do tweet and pass your comments round because that really does keep the conference buzzing and it does actually raise our profile outside Liverpool but in the wider country. So without much further ado, I'm going to introduce my first speaker this morning. And our first speaker this morning is back by popular demand after his sellout gig yesterday. I am delighted to welcome again uh, Martin James. So Martin James is a consultant stroke physician at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital and associate professor at the University of Exeter Medical School. He has led the East Devon Stroke Service at the Royal Devon Hospital since 1997. He is an Associate Director of the Stroke Programme at the Royal College of, Co uh, of Physicians of London and he has responsibility for the National Peer Review Scheme. He was Joint Editor of the 216 RCP National Clinical <coughs> Guideline for Stroke. So back by popular demand, please put your hands together and welcome Martin. Thanks, Adam. I don't really think any, anyone wanted to hear all that again. Um, so uh, this morning we're going to look at uh, what's new in the 2016 guidelines and I'm going to start with the sort of hyperacute and acute side of things. Um, it's going to be a whistle stop tour uh, provided the slides move on when instructed. And so we're going to take a quick look at uh, five areas where the uh, national guideline recommendations have, have been altered or, or uh, been significantly different to 2012. Um, and we'll look at thrombectomy, uh, intravenous thrombolysis, uh, blood pressure lowering, uh, acute imaging, and stroke unit care. As uh, we heard yesterday, uh, we were talking about uh, thrombectomy is uh, the principal uh, advance in hyperacute stroke care since the 2012 guidelines. And um, we have, in the last couple of years, a uh, significant number of primary efficacy randomized controlled trials uh, published and with extraordinary foresight uh, at the European Stroke uh, Conference or ESOC conference in Barcelona in the spring, um, the civic authorities in Barcelona um, uh, appeared to decide that what we needed was a, a giant size stent in one of the, the squares, public squares in Barcelona. Uh, as a tribute to the five RCTs. Um, since then, of course, we've seen uh, the further publication of three trials that were also stopped prematurely because of uh, the uh, publication of the other trials. So we've seen Thrace therapy and PIST in print, and of course the individual patient meta-analysis uh, that goes by the acronym HERMES. And again, this is the, uh, the nub of HERMES, uh, indicating the shift in the modified distribution of modified ranking scores uh, with thrombectomy uh, versus control, which in the vast majority of cases uh, was intravenous uh, thrombolysis, uh, with the number needed to treat, 
uh, for, a, for a, a very good outcome, an independent outcome, a ranking of 0 to 2 uh, of between uh, 3.2 and 7.4, um, or uh, an NNT for a shift in a single uh, ranking category of just 2.6. The other important advance that this represents, of course, is for the first time we've got something that we can offer people who are ineligible for intravenous thrombolysis. Although it's quite a small subset of the overall Hermes meta-analysis, um, the overall impression of the treatment effect in that uh, subgroup uh, was significant. So uh, thrombectomy is uh, demonstrably a treatment that can be offered to people who are otherwise ineligible for IV thrombolysis. Um, what we've also seen uh, this year in publication is an analysis of the time to treatment effect. Um, and uh, in the Hermes meta-analysis, uh, because some of the trials in Hermes involved pre-selection of patients according to a favorable uh, brain imaging profile, uh, the uh, time to, to benefit uh, looks to be a little bit longer than this example, which is Mr. Clean, uh, the Dutch trial, which probably most closely reflects how thrombectomy might be implemented in the UK, uh, showing a significant advantage out to a time to reperfusion of uh, six hours. So you're really talking about a time to groin puncture of about five hours uh, to, to get the clot out within six hours. We also saw uh, yesterday this uh, recent uh, cost-effectiveness analysis uh, from the States uh, uh, of the Hermes trials, um, and uh, it, they came up with an incremental cost-effectiveness ratio of just over $3,000 per quali, uh, which compares very favorably with many of the things that the NHS does at the moment. What this has been able to do is uh, subdivide that cost-effectiveness uh, according to other patient characteristics. So what we've got, for example, down here is the uh, pre-randomization aspect score and the, these are all, each dot here is a single run of the simulation. Uh, and we see that really the uh, only doubt creeps in uh, where there is um, an aspect score before randomization of 0 to 5. In other words, evidence of substantial uh, established cerebral infarction at randomization. And then here, uh, similarly, we've got doubt creeping in uh, when the occlusion is, is in anything beyond the M1 segment. So for the ICA and for the M1, uh, a very strong case for cost effectiveness, less so with the more distal occlusions. So what does all that mean for what's in the guidelines? Well, uh, we're recommending that uh, the combination of IV thrombolysis and intra-arterial clot extraction should be used for people with a proximal occlusion um, and with a uh, measurable neurological deficit provided the procedure can begin within five hours. And then, of course, we are able to recommend that for those who are ineligible for IV uh, thrombolysis, that thrombectomy is also an option under similar circumstances. And then, of course, uh, going beyond that uh, to a less emphatic recommendation uh, about patients where, um, uh, with posterior circulation occlusion, uh, where it may well be worth going beyond five hours. And then, in a nodding recognition to the uh, pre-selection of people with favorable imaging profiles in the RCTs, uh, if, they have, uh, if you're able to pre-select people with a favorable imaging profile, again, there may be some logic in trying to open the artery uh, beyond or, or groin puncture beyond five hours. So that's uh, certainly one of the most uh, significant new recommendations uh, within the 2016 guideline. But of course, that's in the context of what's been going on with intravenous thrombolysis. Now, we don't have any new randomized controlled trial uh, primary efficacy evidence uh, since IST3 uh, was published in 2012 uh, with its uh, accompanying Cochrane review. So that remains the uh, primary evidence uh, of efficacy, and as you might imagine, if that hasn't been added to uh, since 2012, then the guideline essentially remains unchanged. What we have seen, of course, and what we heard about from Tom Robinson yesterday, uh, was the uh, Enchanted study looking at two different doses um, in, um, uh, of 
uh, TPA at 0.9 milligrams per kilogram or 0.6. And to distill that down into a single message, uh, essentially uh, there's a lower risk with the lower dose without it quite meeting that non-inferiority threshold uh, in Anderson's publication uh, earlier this year. Um, and of course, uh, the suggestion is made in Enchanted that maybe you might like to use the lower dose in people where you were uh, suspicious that they were at greater than average risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. The difficulty from that comes from, it's actually rather difficult to spot who might be at greater risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. So in Will Whiteley's uh, meta-analysis of risk factors for intracerebral hemorrhage with IV thrombolysis, we got a, a range of uh, risk factors which broadly encompasses most of the people we end up treating, um, and that makes it difficult to know which patients we should be choosing the lower dose uh, or not. The other thing that's happened to intravenous thrombolysis, of course, since 2012 is we've had what I might call a little local difficulty uh, with the MHRA uh, safety review of the existing evidence base. Um, and, of course, there was concern around the time of the publication of Roger Shinton's letter in The Lancet and so on that we might see a dip in the uptake of IV thrombolysis. This chart is from SNAP. Uh, this shows... Oops. This shows the uh, current uh, uh, thrombolysis rate in the UK outside Scotland. And here's the MHRA report. Uh, doubtless the stats might say that there's a bit of a difference between 12% and 11%. But in the most recent reporting period, uh, we're back to 12% uh, thrombolysis rate. So if there was a small effect, it appears to have been relatively transient. So perhaps we might not be surprised if the new guideline uh, lifts or cuts and pastes the recommendations from 2012 uh, about uh, the use of intravenous thrombolysis with a caveat in the attending text about circumstances under which uh, a thrombolyzing clinician and or their patient may choose to forego some of the potential disability benefit from the higher dose uh, for the sake of the lower risk of a complication uh, at the lower dose. But uh, the other thing about intravenous thrombolysis is that the recommendations are still pushing hard around the issue of time to treatment, and we need to keep uh, pushing to reduce time to treatment uh, by every means possible in order to maximize the benefit. Uh, so there's an emphasis in 2016 about uh, expediting pre-hospital assessment, uh, using a pre-alert, and all the processes in hospital that speed up the delivery of treatment. Because, of course, what we're trying to do is we're trying to move patients uh, to a better number needed to treat in an earlier category. And, of course, those principles apply as much to uh, thrombectomy as they do to thrombolysis. So there's an even greater uh, priority on, on speed when it comes to treatment. Um, what's going on in the UK about door-to-needle time? Here's uh, SNAP data uh, from 2013. And over uh, the three years, we've seen average door-to-needle time um, in the UK outside Scotland uh, fall from 59 minutes to 52 minutes. Uh, so we seem to be speeding up by the grand total of 2 minutes 20 seconds per year. Uh, so depending on what your target is, um, then uh, it may be some time at that sort of rate before we're down to the sort of levels which we might like to see of an average door-to-needle time of somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes, where there is some consolation or reassurance that... Um, we're speeding up three times as quickly as the Americans. <clears throat> so what's the new guideline saying about uh, uh, those sort of aspects of treatment? Uh, well, uh, there's observational evidence of a shorter door-to-needle time in centers that uh, see and treat more patients. Uh, so uh, there's an emphasis on uh, speeding up uh, door-to-needle time and the direct admission of patients with suspected acute stroke so they're assessed and treated as quickly as possible. Um, and an emphasis that alteplase cannot be seen as an isolated treatment. It has to be in the context of a well-organized stroke service. It can't be something done casually or ad hoc. So what about intracerebral hemorrhage? What, uh, where's the movement and the evidence base going with uh, intracerebral hemorrhage? Well, as we heard from uh, Rustam Salman yesterday, uh, there have been disappointments uh, with things like patch, 
Uh, and of course, the other area where the evidence has moved on since 2012 uh, is uh, with acute blood pressure lowering in intracerebral hemorrhage. And we're faced with uh, two trials which, uh, at a, on a superficial level, might appear to be apparently contradictory. We've got uh, Interact 2 uh, from 2013. Uh, again, um, 2,800 patients with mainly small and deep uh, intracerebral hemorrhages, trying to get the blood pressure below 140 within an hour. Uh, and then earlier this year, we had Qureshi's publication of Attached 2, which was 1,000 patients within four and a half hours, again with rather small and deep intracerebral hemorrhages, trying to get blood pressure to a lower level, uh, although not in quite such a hurry. Now, I would caution anybody uh, against uh, interpreting any attempt at meta-analysis uh, of these two trials, because they are very different uh, and not really comparable in their methodology. Um, and so I would uh, be very wary of any message that might come out of an attempt at meta-analysis. But how do we try and reconcile these two uh, apparently contradictory trials? Uh, well, uh, it's possible to drill down into the data uh, and we see that in attached to most patients actually had blood pressure lowering before they were then randomized as if they were being randomized to the subsequent target to which uh, we would attempt to get the patient. So attached to is in effect a trial of the extent to which we would wish to intervene. Um, and of course it was neutral with some significant adverse effects. So Interact 2 uh, uh, appears to suggest that blood pressure lowering to about 140, which is where most of the attached two patients started before they were randomized, is actually likely to be helpful. Uh, but attached 2 itself suggests that pushing beyond that to a, a, a lower level is unlikely to help further. And of course we've got to bear in mind uh, that it's the, the debate, the quality of the debate here is not really the, quite the same as with Enchanted because intracerebral hemorrhage is a treatment uh, with no other proven, proven options other than specialist stroke unit care. So how have we um, blended that uh, into the new guideline? Uh, well, uh, patients with primary intracerebral hemorrhage uh, and a blood pressure above 150 uh, should have their blood pressure lowered to 140 for at least seven days, taking into account the exclusions that were used in Interact 2, and emphasizing that that's not the only thing that you should be doing. You should be admitting them directly to a hyperacute unit and observing for the immediate complications of intracerebral hemorrhage. And that's the current state of play with the uh, evidence base for blood pressure lowering. So what about acute brain imaging? Uh, well, the goalposts are constantly moving uh, with uh, acute scanning. Um, obviously, uh, there's many other uh, issues going on that drive the agenda with acute scanning. Uh, we've got, obviously, intravenous thrombolysis and the identification of large vessel occlusions. We need to know as soon as possible whether someone's a hemorrhage or not. Um, and we've got an increasing proportion of people with acute stroke or suspected stroke uh, presenting within three hours. The other thing we've seen this year, of course, is Peter Rothwell's analysis of the antiplatelet data, suggesting that uh, uh, the benefits of early aspirin in stroke are substantial and have been underrated or underreported in previous publication. So again, uh, we, we, the guideline group didn't agree that you could simply give antiplatelet treatment without the knowledge of what the underlying pathology was. So it's another emphasis on learning what the pathology is at the earliest possible opportunity. Now, since 2004, uh, we've known from uh, Joanna Wardlaw's uh, HTA analysis that acute or immediate imaging uh, is the most uh, cost-effective option, and we've taken an incremental approach since then uh, to uh, time to scanning. And since the 2012 recommendation of 12 hours uh, for acute scanning, we've seen the proportion of people scanned within that time limit uh, steadily rising. And, of course, uh, the new guideline says that we should be uh, advocating imaging uh, of all cases of suspected acute stroke uh, within one hour of arrival. Um, also, making the point about imaging people for suspected large artery occlusion in that patients with ischemic stroke who are eligible for endovascular therapy should have a CT angiogram uh, from aortic arch to skull vertex to identify that large vessel occlusion. Now, um, 
we've seen significant progress with scanning within one hour, uh, even in recent years. This is the proportion from SNAP scanned within one hour, which in 2013 was 41%, and in 2016 is 51%. Um, and so there's a, a strong secular trend there, regardless of recommendations. Um, and this is probably the low-hanging fruit of people who can be scanned because they presented during uh, office hours. And the challenge, of course, is going to be raising that proportion further uh, for, pe for people who are presenting outside of office hours. And what else should be happening quickly for people with suspected acute stroke? Well, uh, they should be getting to a stroke unit within four hours. And this is, again, the SNAP data for the last three years, which shows an interesting uh, uh, rhythmic trend by season. Um, according to winter and summer, we've got 62% getting uh, there within four hours in the summer and 54% uh, within four hours uh, in the winter. And if you're inclined to look at that and think, well, it's only a few percent, it doesn't really matter. Here's that ski slope uh, of the proportion uh, admitted to a stroke unit within four hours across uh, the UK outside Scotland, uh, running between 22% and 84%. And the difference between summer and winter is uh, the difference in performance between these two points on that graph. Uh, and uh, there's an awful lot of people who are missing out on access to stroke unit care because of other distracting pressures in the winter. And of course, uh, since 2012, we've accumulated further principally observational data uh, about the benefits of getting to a stroke unit quickly. Uh, we've seen uh, Ben Bray's uh, analysis of the, the relationship between nurse staffing ratios at the weekend and what your expected mortality is uh, even if you're admitted to the stroke unit on a weekday. And uh, if the national average is somewhere around about here, um, there's still significant further gains to be had uh, with a better ratio of uh, acute nursing to, to, to patients. Also, we've seen uh, observational evidence of the advantage from uh, early as possible assessment of the safety of your swallow. So this is the risk of aspiration pneumonia by your time to swallow screening, again, for a year's worth of patients in SNAP. And the sooner that you get your swallow assessed and appropriate measures taken, uh, the less the risk of aspiration pneumonia. Now, what we've done in uh, the 2016 guideline, of course, is uh, reproduce and uh, expand uh, the much talked about uh, table 2.1 from the 2012 guideline. Uh, and given the feedback that we've received from professionals about the importance of laying down a marker for uh, staffing, at least in hyperacute and acute uh, staffing, uh, this is uh, further strengthened in the 2016 uh, guideline. So what's the new guideline saying about stroke unit access? Well, again, we're saying if you've got a stroke, you should be on a stroke unit, uh, motherhood and apple pie there. Um, you should be admitted directly and assessed for emergency treatments as soon as possible. Uh, you should uh, be supported by uh, practice protocols uh, to reduce the risk of things like aspiration pneumonia and sepsis and so on. And a, a particular point made about uh, measures that should be taken uh, in order to... Uh, uh, pr protect against the development of aspiration pneumonia. So we're pushing hard in the 2016 edition about uh, urgent access to a specialist stroke unit. <coughs> and if you think that that's, um, I've received the chairman's cough, but it's all right, I've got two more slides. Uh, I thought uh, I was being really subtle. Yeah, that was very discreet, <laughs> Avril, yeah. <laughs> um, but if you think this is just kind of a narrow specialty interest saying that our patients should be getting onto a specialist unit. Um, uh, it's not. It's reflecting a secular trend uh, in NHS policy more widely. These are the 10 uh, clinical standards produced by Sir Bruce Keogh um, for emergency, uh, all emergency conditions. And we've got uh, emergencies with a mortality of more than 10% are seen by a suitable consultant within an hour. We've got diagnostic tests where the test will alter the management, uh, should be available within an hour. We've got uh, inpatients having 24-7 access to uh, consultant-directed interventions. And we've got all patients in high dependency areas being reviewed twice daily by a uh, consultant. And the latest uh, NHS planning guidance, which has just gone out to CCGs and trusts uh, uh, in the last few weeks uh, is uh, adjusting the NHS contract 
uh, so that uh, these four priority clinical standards are implemented in all acutely admitting stroke centres by uh, autumn 2017, so we've, we've got a year. So we're not just ploughing a narrow specialty interest type of furrow, we're reflecting uh, what there is in, in the way of a secular trend in all emergency medical treatments. And we hope to see further gains in terms of reductions in mortality and disability from the application of all these interventions in hyperacute stroke care. Thank you very much.